Good morning and welcome everyone to third day of Precision Agriculture Crop Hour webinar. I am Dr. Ali Mirza Khani Nafchi, Assistant Professor and Precision Agriculture Extension Specialist here at South Dakota State University. We will start with our first speaker, Dr. Sushant Mehan. Dr. Mehan is a dedicated hydrologist with a profound commitment to understanding and effectively managing our water resources. With a diverse background in hydrology and environmental science, he has significantly contributed to the field by addressing critical issue impacting our water quality and availability. His research is instrumental in ensuring effective water resource management. Dr. Mehan continues to be an invaluable asset to hydrology working on how we understand and manage our water systems. Dr. Mehan will share his insights on water smart farming and precision techniques for cover success using advanced technologies and methods to optimize water use for crop. These approaches can address the challenges of water management. Following that, I am excited to be your second speaker. My focus will be on precision cover cropping system in South Dakota, where I will share my research and open the floor for a, a Q&A session. Please use this opportunity to engage and ask your questions and share your thoughts. Thank you for being here. Let's begin with our first speaker, Dr. Mehan. Over to you, Dr. Mehan. Thank you, Ali. Uh, I hope you can see my slides. We can. Awesome. So good morning all once again. Uh, my name is Sushant and I'm an assistant professor and SDSU Extension Water Resource Engineer Specialist in the Ag and Biosystem Engineering Department at South Dakota State University, Brookings, South Dakota. Today, we will explore an essential concept that can reshape our approach to farming. Um, water smart farming. In a world where the water resources are becoming scarcer and the need for the sustainable agriculture is paramount, embracing water smart farming is not just a choice, but it's a necessity. That being said, so the outline of my talk would include an introduction to water smart farming. We will explore various techniques central to this initiative, including variable rate irrigation, which makes water match the unique needs of each field. Uh, we'll talk about automation in soil moisture monitoring, ensuring that irrigation is a timely response, not a scheduled guess. And we'll also talk about sensing crop water stress to detect when actually plant needs water very precisely. And then we'll talk about utilizing advanced mapping for precise management of crop residues and cover crops. Um, I have a slide on drainage water recycling as well. That will is a good source to uh, recycle the wastewater on the farm into a resourceful water resource. Uh, and then at last, we'll talk about the rainwater harvesting to supplement our water needs. As we close, uh, remember this, that water smart farming is more than just a set of techniques. It's a future-proof philosophy for agriculture. Questions are welcome as we aim to deepen our understanding together. And you can see a Q&A box. If you have any questions, start putting your questions there. Um, by the end of the presentation, I'll take those questions. Um, before actually defining what water smart farming is, uh, let's talk about the figure that is on the right. The figure here illustrates the shift of the 100th meridian. Historically, this is the line that divides dry and the wet regions in the US, which has moved 140 miles east in the past 100 years. It's predicted to move another 100 miles by 2100. This highlights that the changing climatic patterns, and given the facts speak for themselves, we need solution to solve water problems. And today, these slides 
in these slides, I will share with you how water smart farming can help combat some of these water problems. Now, coming back to the main topic, what is water smart farming? Water smart farming is a holistic approach that integrates various strategies to optimize our use of water resources in agriculture. It's about being smart, efficient, and sustainable in managing water throughout the farming. The key components of the water smart farming includes water conservation, which is at the heart of the water smart farming. It involves using water uh, it involves using the water efficiently and reducing as much wastage as possible. For example, imagine if you have an irrigation system that currently uses 10,000 gallons of water per hour. By upgrading to an efficient system, including variable rate irrigation, which we will be discussing in the subsequent slide, with more modern sensors and wireless technology that reduces water usage to 8,000 gallons per hour. Think about 2,000 gallons every hour of operation is what you save besides energy cost. And if we take it over the entire growing season, think about the significant cost savings. In component is water harvesting. It's about capturing either the rainwater or the drainage water that we will be talking about today, uh, collecting and storing that kind of water, which can provide a valuable source of irrigation when it is needed. For example, if you have a 5,000 square feet on your farm that can store one inch of the precipitation of the rain, and if we use these numbers, 5,000 square feet, one inch of rain, together these numbers can give you 3,125 gallons of the water with that much amount of the rain. And think about the area which is highly dependent on rainfall variability and not the length of the, uh, I should say, not the total amount of the rainfall in the growing season, I think this kind of water smart farming technique can really help to preserve water and can use it when it is actually needed. The third most important thing is improve irrigation uh, accessibility and water use efficiency. Access to the irrigation and uh, efficient water use is crucial. Modernizing our irrigation systems and adopting technologies that optimize water distributions are the key components of water smart farming. Here's an illustration. Suppose your current irrigation system on your farm is 75% efficient. Thinking about where the 25% is going. Either it is going as a runoff or it has been lost to, uh, as an evaporative loss. Upgrading it to a system can substantially reduce the water wastage. Now we are talking about irrigation systems that can give you approximately 90% efficiency. If you do math, so that means you are saving those water, 15% water wastage there. Uh, the next important component of water smart farming is increase water infiltration and decrease runoff. Water infiltration ensures that water soaks into the soil rather than running off. Techniques such as no-till farming, cover crops can help increase water infiltration. Think about if you are just reducing the runoff by only 20%, what are the larger benefits that you are getting for higher infiltration and retention in the soil? Above all, we are protecting our environment by re reducing the water waste and erosion, leading to healthier soils and water bodies. The fifth component is reducing soil evaporation. Soil evaporation occurs when water from the soil surface evaporates into the air. Employing mulching techniques and reducing the bare soil can help minimize this loss. Technically, if you leave your residue on the bare soil, it can act as a mulch and that can reduce the evaporation somewhere from 20% to even 70%. And finally, Enhancing crop productivity is the major component of water smart farming. Ultimately, water, water smart farming aims to enhance crop productivity. By efficiently managing water resources, we can ensure our crops receive the right amount of the water at the right time, leading to healthier and more productive yields. Example, optimizing irrigation schedule based on the crop needs Research says that we can increase the yield by somewhere from 10% to 20%. And think about 10 to 20% increase in yield on a 100 acre farm can be really substantial. Now let's talk more about techniques. So we learned what is water smart farming. Now, what are far water smart farming techniques? The first one I would like to discuss is variable rate irrigation. 
Variable rate irrigation is an advanced method in precision agriculture that optimizes water use by tailoring irrigation to the specific needs of the different field areas. It involves varying the rate of water applied to crops based on factors such as soil type, topography, and the crop type. This technology aims to enhance water efficiency and improve crop yields while potentially reducing the water and energy use. As you can see on this slide, research by Barker et al. in 2018 in Nebraska, they were able, with variable rate irrigation, they were able to reduce irrigation by 0.5 inches for soybean and 0.1 inches for corn. The variable rate irrigation system can be controlled by adjusting the speed of irrigation pivot or by operating individual sprinklers, allowing for precise application. Adopting variable rate irrigation requires careful consideration of the field's variability and the creation of detailed irrigation plan known as prescription map, the map that you are seeing on the top of the slide with the different eyes on the circle. So these kind of maps are usually developed using the field data and geographical information system GIS. This enables farmer to apply water nutrients and pesticides more efficiently, thus supporting more sustainable farming practices. If you think about VRI, the main components of variable rate irrigation include wireless nodes that are basically mounted on the length of the irrigator and communicate wirelessly to the main controller. Then you can even monitor your individual sprinkler control. Each sprinkler can be controlled individually, allowing for more precise water application. And then finally, matching the soil type and the terrain. The system can adapt the irrigation rate according to the different soil types and topography. The best benefit is if there is a creek flowing through your farm, or if there is a structure in your farm that you don't want to water using your sprinkler, you can avoid those areas also. So you can program accordingly. The next thing I want to talk about is automating soil moisture monitoring and field irrigation. The figure here on the slide shows a dashboard for monitoring agriculture conditions and irrigation systems, providing a real-time data on various metrics. Various metrics include temperature, humidity readings, wind speed, precipitation, and lightning risk. Additionally, it features graphs on the water consumption, pump warning indicator, histogram that can track how much gallons of water per minute you have saved. So overall, if you see this technology is typically used in precision agriculture to enhance water efficiency and manage water resources more effectively, allowing farmers to make more informed decision based on current field conditions and reduce overall overhead cost. The third thing I want to talk about is remote sensing applications. From the last two days, we are talking about, I think on the very first state of uh, Precision Ag uh, webinar, we talked about remote sensing. So I would just brief you what I'm, uh, I want to say on this slide. So this schematic illustrates our vision for a smart farm employing the proposed zero power and low cost sensor. I'm talking about technologies. Technologies can really cost heavy. Uh, drain on your pocket. So now this thing, what I'm talking is, why not to use the remote sensing or low sensors, uh, low cost sensors? So the figure on this uh, left side is basically showing you a smart farm with zero power and low cost sensor nodes in a crop field with high spatial granularity. The figure B is schematic of a wireless sensor node used for non-contact water stress detection in the plants. So how does that work? The switch closes and connects to the battery to active electronics upon plant water stress condition. What does that mean? The sensor remains otherwise off with zero drain on the battery. Whenever the plant is under water stress condition, it will turn on, will connect to the battery, and it will automate the system and eventually run your uh, irrigation system for that particular crop. So we are talking about for each crop not even the field now. So with water smart farming techniques. Um, crop residue. So crop residue, the plant material remaining after a harvest can be used as a water smart farming technique in several ways. Crop residue act as a mulch layer, reducing water evaporation from the soil. It helps to slow down water flow over a field and allowing more time for the water to soak into the soil. 
As a decomposes, craft residue adds organic matter to the soil, improving its structure and ability to retain water. Farmers and other agriculture stakeholders can improve water efficiency and contribute to sustainable farming practices by maintaining crop residue. We largely see that conservation tillage is an important best management practice, often emphasized in watershed implementation plans to meet the water quality objectives. Conservation tillage maintains crop residue on the soil surface, protects soil from wind and water erosion, reducing moisture loss and increasing soil carbon storage. Traditionally, crop residue was assessed using in-field observations, but these methods are not cost uh, effective over large land areas. And there was a need, there was an interest in the tool to map the distribution of crop residue and corresponding tillage intensities throughout the agricultural landscape. And satellite remote sensing can provide ability to map residue at the landscape. And this is what this figure is showing you. This figure is a map that uses satellite imagery to show how much plant material or crop residue is left in agriculture field during a season. Different shades of tan indicate different amounts of residue ranging from bare soil, that means no residue, to fields fully covered with residue, that means 100% of the cover. This map type helps farmers understand their fields better, showing where crops are growing well and where they might, um, where they might need to make changes. On this figure, uh, there's a, this is a data visualization related to use of the cover crops. So in the previous slide, we talked about residue. We here we are talking about cover crops in agriculture over a span of years and across different regions. The first map on the top left shows the average percentage of a cover crop acres across certain years, varying sh with varying shades of green indicating the extent of the cover crop used in each region. So this is a map for the South Dakota, and the darker green regions are uh, showing an increase. Um, and the second map on the right, on the top right, um, is basically showing the percentage change in the cover crop usage between the selected years, with green indicating an increase and orange a decrease. The accompanying charts below provide a more detailed view of the average percentage of the cover crop acres over a time and percentage change between the years respectively, likely offering a visual summary of the trends in the cover crop adoption and changes over time in a specific area. This slide and the last one, as I said, summarize the ability of the remote sensing to provide its users with the extent of crop residue and cover crops on the agriculture land. And there are tools to visualize all these data. So you don't have to spend a single penny for seeing what is happening. The next thing I want to talk about is drainage water recycling. Another water smart farming technique is drainage water recycling. It captures water uh, in a pond or a reservoir or a drainage ditch and put, then put it back on the farm when we need irrigation or have deficit water conditions to improve the yield. So there's another benefit when it comes down to water quality as well, which I think we have talked yesterday in our seminar. The figure here basically illustrates the concept of drainage water recycling in agriculture. It shows how water drained from the fields can be collected in a reservoir and reused for irrigation. This system allows for conservation of water resources, potentially improving crop yield and contributing to water quality benefits and by reducing runoff. Why this is so important? There are certain ex research experiments conducted. One that I know of, they conducted uh, at a certain V6 stage of the corn. So they concluded that if the soil was saturated for a day to the three days, there was a reduction of a crop yield from six to 11 bushels per acre for that. And soils also remain saturated. So the idea here is to inform you that the amount of the water available for use at every single stage of the crop growth matters. It can either boost or kills the growth. Um, Excess water must be drained off in a timely manner, not only when it comes to yield, but also when it comes down to fertilizer loss issues. And when there is this mechanism where you can use the excess water draining out of the field again for irrigation, I think it's a win-win situation. The water smart farming includes providing stakeholders with a tools to estimate and uh, 
see the crop water use of their fields. And one of the such tools is OpenET. So OpenET provides a satellite based uh, as estimates of the total amount of the water transferred from the land surface to the atmosphere through evapotranspiration. This is also referred to as actual evapotranspiration since it represents an estimate of actual amount of ET that occurred over a specified time period. OpenET provides ET data from multiple satellite driven models and also calculates single ensemble value from those models. All of the models included in OpenET Ensemble have been used by the government agencies responsible for water user reporting and management in the world. Some models are even widely used internationally. All models currently use Landsat satellite data to produce ET information at the spatial resolution of 0.2 acres per pixel, that means 30 by 30 meters pixel. If we have time at the end, or if someone is interested, please reach out and I can assist you how to use this tool. So the tool that you're using, you can even go to specific field of yours and you can see how the ET looks like in the past years um, and how you should be planning your irrigation for the next year, for the next growing season. Here, and the last one is the rainwater harvesting. As per USGS report published in 2015, withdrawals for a livestock use were an estimated 2,000 million gallons per day for 2015. And out of these 2,000 million gallons, one person was coming from total freshwater withdrawals and the rest of the water was coming from the groundwater. In this situation, we can adopt a water smart farming technique to elevate the pressure on the surface and the groundwater sources. Rainwater harvesting for livestock involves collecting precipitation from structures like barn and using it as an alternative or supplemental water resource. It can help reduce reliance on other water supplies, lower operation costs, and provide water during droughts or emergencies. The setup includes catchment area, conveyance system, and storage tanks. The feasibility of using rainwater harvesting depends on factors like regional rainfall, water needs, catchment area size, and storage capacity. It can support various livestock needs from drinking water to feed preparation and cleaning areas. Fortunately, South Dakota doesn't have any regulations to store rain. So as far as the rules are concerned, we are open to use our, uh, this particular technique to save more water in the time of the need. So there is also an equation on this slide. If you put uh, the size of the area you will use for the, um, you will use to collect the rainwater from in square feet, and then multiply the amount of the rain in inches, and then multiply both these things again by 0 0.623, which is a coefficient that will, Give, the resultant will give you amount of the gallons of the collected rainwater volume. For example, if the catchment area is, let's say it's 3,200 square foot barn and the rainfall is four inches of monthly rainfall that you're capturing, coefficient is 0 0.623. Uh, 0 0.623. If you multiply all these three values, we get approximately 8,000 gallons of the collected rain Vol uh, rainwater volume for that month. But we know uh, in reality, we are not gonna capture every four inch, right? So there will be some losses, losses due to conveyance or there may be heavy rainfall, there can be an overflow or other losses. So even if we multiply that, if we think that there's 90% capture and if we multiply this 8,000 by uh, 90%, still we are getting 7,200 uh, 7, uh, gallons of the rainwater. So it's pretty neat, easy to do uh, thing, and uh, that can help us, um, especially if we are dependent on rain and if you're looking for an other alternative uh, source of water. To conclude, uh, water smart farming is essential in our changing climate uh, where water is becoming scarce. By adopting techniques like efficient irrigation systems, rainwater harvesting, and soil moisture management, we can use water more sustainably in agriculture. Technologies like variable rate irrigation help to apply water precisely where it's needed. And innovative sensors can detect 
when plants need water. Conservation practices like maintaining crop residue, improve soil health and water retention. These methods save water and increase crop productivity, contributing to a more sustainable and profitable future. If you have any questions related to my presentation, this is my contact information and this QR code will lead you to my lab, what I do, what other things I do besides what I presented today. Uh, here's a number that you can reach out to me. This is the email. Um, and with this, so this is a civil rights statement uh, for, and with this, I open the house for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mehan. Um, I'm checking the Q&A session. If there is any question here, please, um, if you have any question, put it on Q&A session, uh, or you can directly reach to Dr. Mehan. And if there are no questions, I would and like to invite our next speaker, yeah. Ali, you want to say something? Sorry. Sure. Yes. Before before you go, thanks. Uh, we have a poll. Please uh, answer the question, and it will help us to improve our program. Yes. Back to you, Dr. Mehan. Thank you, Ali. So I would like to invite Ali again, who is an assistant professor in SDX2 Extension Precision Ag Specialist and a very good friend of mine, who will talk about precision cover cropping system. Ali, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So uh, I wait for a few more minutes for the, not minutes, just maybe one minute for the poll. Sure. And uh, then I will start. So far we have 16 <clears throat> participants who have participated in the poll. So I would appreciate okay. if other participants can also put their views in. Great. All right, so let's begin. Thank you very much again. Um, today, I am going to talk about precision cover cropping system. And when we are talking about the precision, always we are thinking about variation in a field and how we want to address those variations. So when we go for whole field management, we will have a whole field as one management zone and we treat whole field as one session. But when we are talking about the zone management, we consider the variation in a field and we divide those variations by the, the their ID we have might be yield or other um, properties and information we can gather. And based on that, we can treat each zone individually. That's called zone management. So variation in a field results tremendous amount of variability in yield. Even all crop inf input, irrigation, fertilizer, seeding rate, you name them, are same for different location in a field the yield variation will be there. So you can see in a field from the top view, you can see all the variations. So how to identify the soil variation and create zones? We can get use of aerial imagery, like NDVI, thermal, using drones or satellite, soil electrical conductivity, soil mapping, yield maps, and Soil survey provided by USDA, which is free of charge and can be used. So the good news is if we do them right, 
um, soil EC aerial imagery yield data have really good correlation and we can use either of them or combine together. But the point is sometimes we should be careful when we use yield data or, or even soil EC because some changes may cause some elevation in data and you, you have to consider for all the numbers and always we can have a chicken port or validation uh, method means if we go with yield data, we can have soil sampling also. Or, or if we go with aerial imagery, we can have soil EC data as well. So now, why precision cover cropping system and how precision cover cropping system can improve my production and soil health and farm profits? So as you know, when, when we have variation in soil properties, so it, it, it causes variation in water holding capacity, infiltration rate, and so, soil nutrient availability. Precision Ag can help to address these variations by applying right input in the right amount to the right place at the right time in the right manner. That's five hours of precision agriculture. So now, considering these five hours in the precision cover cropping practices, so we want to write mix selection, means choosing right seed mix and right seeding rate for each location or different zones. And right seed placement, right time, and right manner, or, or right method, how we want to do it. So how we can decide about variable seeding rate and seed mix selection? So in mixed seed selection or variable seeding rate, variabilities to consider are not only limited to these soil variations. Even for crop production, we are not thinking about only the soil variations. We, we consider all other uh, parameters. Maybe a slope, if, is it south slope, north slope, uh, and, and topography, and other, other parameters. Now, for uh, precision cover cropping system, we want to consider those parameters even uh, more in depth to compensate and uh, compensate for those variations which is going to limit our production. How? So we have soil temperature differences. What if we provide different seed mix selection to compensate and have at least compensate some, some temperature variation, make it so better uniform, and then you will have uniform stand or uniform germination. Soil properties, this is obvious. When we have different soil uh, properties or texture, we may need to apply different cover crop and, and the, the needs are different because we want to apply, let's say for compact the soil, we want to apply soil to loosening the soil particles. For sandy soil, we want to add a cover crop with higher dry mass to add more organic matter and so on and so forth. Disease and pest. So because we have soil variation, some disease have correlation with the soil texture, even nematodes. So when we have this correlation, we can use it and mitigate the improvement of the population of the pest in those area by not putting the co-host of that pest on that area. So we will talk about this topography and aspect, compaction and heart time. So we have different needs. We can address it with different um, seed mixture and variable seeding rate. Let's talk about soil temperature. Soil with cover crop, the soil will be cooler. Higher organic matter, warmer the soil. These are obvious and facts. 
higher soil moisture content cooling cooler the soil and deeper in soil profile cooler but less temperature fluctuation so the soil we, we can actually use thermal aerial imagery satellite imagery to detect and and read these temperature variation when we have soil we a sandy soil the max uh, will be 55 and, and certain measurement we measure uh, with no cover crop same time on clay area the temperature was 41 means when you have sandy soil, the temperature would be higher. Why? Because they absorb more. And clay soil has more moisture. Remember, we said cool, most higher moisture content, cooler the soil. The and the fluctuation is 14 degrees centigrade. Now, if we have cover crop, the temperature will go down but the fluctuation will reduce too. So it means we have a uniform temperature for germination. In depth, the fluctuation will reduce, but the temperature also will reduce. So we will have with no or, or bare soil, no cover crop, we have max 43. We had with the calculation. And the mean was 33 centigrade, but the fluctuation was 10 degree. Whereas when we had at the depth of four inches, the max for sandy soil was 30, means 13 degree less. And, and the fluctuation was three degrees. So topography and aspect, this is obvious when we have south slope versus north slope. South slope will gain and absorb more heat, more energy of the sun. And north slope, um, this is for northern hemisphere. In, in south hemisphere is different, means it's opposite, exactly. But for us, south slope will get or absorb more energy, more heat. More heat means higher temperature. And when we have higher temperature, what we will see, we will see melting snows earlier, higher temperature, germination, and then you will have uneven stand or not uniform germination in your field. Even in a small, you know, a slope in a field, you can see these variations. This is not only because of the temperature, but also because when, when you have this slope, the, the snow will melt, the temperature will go away, and uh, so you will get uh, this uneven stand in your field. So with technology now we have satellite imagery, with drones, with sensors, we can collect all of these informations and have it for satellite imagery, it would be free of charge. For drone also, we, we can have um, very in, as, uh, inexpensive drones that you can use and, and collect this information and use it on your seed mix selection and also variable rate. So when we want to consider the seeding rate uh, variation or, or variable seeding rate and seed mix selection, we want to design variable seeding rate for cover crop to compensate the soil temperature variations. We want to, we want to have different seed mix selection can help address the field variation. In sand soil, we want to apply or, or provide more organic matter so with higher dry mass um, cover crops, we can achieve that. So, Different seed mix selection can help managing the pests and diseases. So precision cover cropping system and managing soil compaction. Nationwide farmers um, lose over 1 billion in 
cover revenues every year due to the effects of soil compaction. So in, if the compaction exists, we should do something about it. How to identify compaction problems? So we can see the reduced water infiltration, uneven stand, shallow roots, and also we can have a cone penetrometer is a device to measure the soil compaction. Actually is soil strength, but we call it as compaction in general. So the rule of thumb is when or for using the cone penetrometer, if the strength of soil preventing the cone penetrating into the soil is more than 300 PSI, we want to break it, just like here. So if we have some area of the field from surface all the way to 16 inches, if we have some area that the strength of the soil is more than 300 PSI, we want to rupture that. So how to do it? We don't need to think only about subsoiler. Sometimes, yes, we have to use subsoiler, but not all the time. Rule of thumb is if compaction exists, then deep tillage is needed. But now we want to introduce the deep rooted cover crops that can do the same um, work that deep tillage does for us. So when we have cover crop here in this graph, you can see when we have cover crops, it will break and loosen the, the hard layer. When you don't have cover crop, it, you cannot see any improvement. So deep rooted cover crop and rye, cereal rye. So how, the, the question is, how rye can help to loosen the soil particles? Because it has a, a big number of dry mass or root system. And when you improve the organic matter, your soil would act just like a sponge and it will loosening and the, the hard pan or, or even the hard layer will loosen up and you will have uh, softer soil. So we mentioned about the deep-rooted cover crop can help to improve or, or mitigate your compaction. Even after three years, the soil moisture content for the area we use cover crop was more. This study was on 2015, and we repeated this study for five years. After third year, we, we continuously saw this, um, the soil moisture in area we had cover crop was higher. Cover crops reduce weed pressure. This is our study here in South Dakota State University research farm. And as you can see in left picture, picture number one, the area we have the cover crop the weed pressure is much less compared to the, the side control plot. And the right picture, picture number two, is 60 pounds of rye per acre, which we got highest dry mass. And with that, the up to 94% we control the the weeds. It's not always like that, but it's obvious all of our um, zones, we had the numbers that show supporting that we control the weed pressure. Whereas in, in the control, which we didn't have cover crops, uh, it, it was all weeds. So precision cover crop and control soybean system are we have soil compaction data in the right, and we have soil electrical conductivity in the left. 
So usually when we have higher soil, con higher electrical conductivity in soil, we will have uh, lighter, so um, heavier soil, means clay soil will give us higher electrical conductivity. Lower electrical conductivity is related to sandy soil. Why? Soil electrical conductivity is correlated with the soil particles and the ability of the soil particles to transmit electrical current. And because the soil particle in sandy soil are the numbers are less and bigger soil particles, the electrons cannot travel from particle to per particle easier. And we have less electrolytes in sandy soil. So electrical conductivity in sandy soil always will be less and in clay soil would be higher. So with that, and also the study showed before that when you have the higher void ratio, which you can have it in sandy soil more, the nematodes can grow or, or, or can lay eggs and, and uh, have more population in light soils. We measured the before and after the population of the cyst nematodes. And the nematode count is highly related to the soil compaction and electrical conductivity. So it means if you have the area that you have higher voiding ratio, it will, uh, you, you can see higher population of nematodes. With these information, when we can correlate the population of the nematodes to, this, to these two numbers, which easily we can achieve, we can measure the soil compaction, we can measure the soil electrical conductivity. When we have these two numbers, then it would be very easy for us to mitigate not planting co-host for cis nematode on the area of which we have, we, we see the risk of higher population in cis nematode. So cover cropping system challenges, needs, and opportunities. So we have these cover crops in South Dakota. These are popular cover crops we, we plant. But now what we did, we wanted to see what's the ratio between the root biomass, the root biomass. We want to see what's the upper canopy dry mass compared to the lower, it means underground dry mass. Why do we need that? Because it's needed for, let's say, uh, for aspect, for the area with higher temperature, we want to add, in means equal, let's say we want to uh, add equal dry mass to um, two zones. One is south slope, another is north slope. We want, but we want to add same biomass, dry mass. Then we will choose for the south slope, the, the cover crop that has higher upper canopy biomass. And for the north slope, we will choose a cover crop that has root biomass more. So why? Because then we will not have the cover crop on ground for north slope. The, the snow or, or the temperature will increase because darker soil will absorb more heat or more energy. So when we have difference, differences and identify the zones, we want to uh, address these zones. We want, to, we want to know what we can do about it. And the point is, do we have a machine to plant different seed mix and also different seeding rate? 
combine together? And the answer is no. One more problem we have here is we mix, uh, now you, you hear about this all the time, that we mix the seed mix. Let's say we have seed six seed mix of cover crops. We mix them together and put it in planter. We want to, in the hopper, and we want to plant them. Because of the vibration and because of the seed properties, as, as soon as you start, some seed will dive down and you plant them more at the beginning at, and at the end, you will have some just cow peas and winter peas and so on and so forth. So these are the problem we have. So what we can do about it? Here at South Dakota State University, we develop a machine to uh, have, we will have different hoppers. So this is the design, but we are working on it to complete it. It has different hoppers for different seeds. We can put different seeds and we can rate them in a way that uh, we will place based on the prescription map for each area we want to put which seed mix and which seeding rate. Another design we had here was a system to slow down the seeds while they are moving to the, to the outlet. And while they are moving down, it's just like honeycomb and the seed will slide down and change their direction while they are going down to the outlet. And by that, even if they are not mixed, they will be mixed. So you will maintain the uniformity and avoid the separation. Another project we propose here, uh, and we started working on it is in South Dakota, because we have a short season and we cannot simply wait to harvest the corn and, uh, or, or even soybean. And, but from the maturation of the corn and soybean, we have, let's say two months that uh, sometime one, two months that we are thinking is uh, that the land and all the rain, everything is idle. We want to use that. So for that reason, we are working on seed coating that we can plant, that the ideal is to plant the seed at the beginning when we are placing the main crop. And it would be dormant all the way to the time we are thinking the maturated maturation happens for the main crop and it will take off from there and work. By the time you want to harvest, you will have really good stand. If we are not able to have the, uh, the good coating system to delay the germination, uh, we, we are considering now for shorter uh, means period to delay it only for maybe one and a half month, two months, because we can put it with citrus when we apply citrus. So we, we started this project, but uh, so far we had very short delay up to maybe two weeks, which is not enough, but we are working on it. So finally, we want to have this system to plant cover crop, maybe with uh, interseeder at the time we put side dress nitrogen for corn and the result would be at, by the time we done the maturation, we will get really good stand. Here is my contact information. And please, um, I, I would love to have your question answer here. But if you have any question and you would like to collaborate with this um, project, we will provide EC mapping and, and uh, zone management for your field. We have device to do that, and uh, we would love to work with you. And thank you very much. I'll take your questions. Also, there is a poll. Please uh, uh, answer the, the uh, 
all questions. It will help us to improve our program. Thank you very much. So with that, if there is no question here in Q&A session, uh, I would like to thank you again. And uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Mehan, again. And um, you have a great day. Appreciate that.